They say that the best way to ask for directions is to go to the local pizza delivery service, because they're one of the few people who are guaranteed to know every street within a several mile radius. Well, in our first episode of our pizza delivery diaries, our intrepid hero was caught up in what could best be described as a bit of family trouble. Well, in tonight's episode, which covers chapters 2 and 3, you're not going to believe where his adventures take him. Let's just say it's a lot different from episode 1. Now, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. common legend among truck drivers is that of the black dog. If one is seen on the road during a particularly long trip, it has ominous implications. As pizza delivery drivers, we have a similar story that circulates around as well. There are days when we are running deliveries well into the night, sometimes as late as till 1 a.m., it's not uncommon to see deer, dogs, cats, <laughs> raccoons, and various other animals cross the streets in front of you in the late hours of the night. Several drivers and I have reported seeing the mountain lion or the bobcat during very tiresome long late nights. The black rats, well, that's another phenomenon that I have experienced as well as the other drivers. This entails seeing black shadow-like figures that resemble rats running alongside of the vehicle in your peripheral vision. I have a story about a unique encounter during the wee hours of the night that happened to me on a particularly long and stressful night toward the end of a 14-hour shift. It was insanity. Order after order kept coming up on the screen. Jeez, when are we going to catch a damn break? I said rolling my eyes in frustration. God, these half-price internet orders are kicking our ass, I laughingly exclaimed. No shit, James said. He was one of the other drivers that I get along with pretty well. Oh, still on for some night fishing? I asked. Fuck yeah, he cheerfully replied. Hey, I'll bring a 12-pack this time, he said. You said that last time, goob, I joked. Oh, sounds good to me, I replied, though. I was pretty exhausted, and fatigue was creeping in insidiously. I was beginning to feel dizzy, and my eyelids were getting heavy. I was already running out of energy from my second wind, a renewed burst of energy that I received after the initial wave of fatigue sets in. I was hanging on six hours of sleep in total within the last 48 hours. Well, I printed the ticket out for the order, and it was for a familiar dark stretch of street that I'd delivered to many times before. Contour Road it was a curvy stretch of road that wound to and fro in sharp hairpin turns. It was a heavily wooded pathway with large boulders along the roadside scattered in random locations. This was a very attractive and scenic route during the daytime, but downright eerily spooky at night. There were no street lamps at all, and the luxurious homes were scattered about far off of the main road. So, I was driving along Contour Road, when I saw three deer canter out of the woods in front of me. Then I saw two more running behind them at a faster speed. Suddenly, out of the bushes, what appeared to be about nine or ten more deer began to sprint out into the street as if being pursued by something. I braked to a near stop to see what was going on, and my headlights saw a long and low black figure of some kind of animal that was carrying an entire deer in its jaws. I froze when I realized that whatever this thing was, it was carrying a buck in its jaws that had to weigh over 130 pounds. Jeez, what the hell is that? I said aloud as I watched it carry the buck by the neck into the woods and then disappear. There was the city zoo nearby, and I began to wonder if a big cat was loose. But, wow, this was no cat. It was long and low, no more than three feet off the ground. It was about eight feet long and appeared to have an enormous head and six legs, 
or at least I think it did. I carried a powerful handheld spotlight that I used to spot addresses and apartment buildings at night. I drove forward and saw a clearing. I directed my spotlight toward the clearing and saw the dead deer. It was already torn almost entirely in two. I could see the blood and entrails scattered about. Whatever had taken this deer had to be enormously powerful to tear up an animal this size in a matter of seconds. My heart thudded in my chest, and my ears were ringing at this point. I pointed my light around the edges of the clearing, not daring to get out of the truck. I had obtained my concealed firearm license, and had my loaded 9mm in my hand as well. Then, coming out of the clearing, was the creature I'd seen. My jaw dropped, and my entire body was absolutely petrified with fear. My firearm gave me little comfort at this point. The appearance of the creature was only part of the horror that I'd stumbled upon. Now, as I'd stated before, this was definitely no escaped lion or tiger from the city zoo. This was a creature that more likely resembled an alligator or crocodile in body, but with six legs that were more like a giant centipede's jointed legs with claw-like hooks. The head was the most ghastly part of the creature, as if the body weren't dreadful enough. The head resembled a bizarre amalgamation of a gorilla crossed with a wolf. The eyes were enormous and bright white with compound multifaceted pupils. Its eyes were full of an intelligence that bore into my own eyes like it was looking me over. Its gaze had a hypnotic effect on me, and I felt as if I couldn't turn my eyes away from it. It had a tail that resembled a scorpion's tail, but flattened out and low slung. The color of the creature was a beautifully terrifying glossy black hue, and the teeth, well, the teeth were shark-like and very long and thick and surprisingly white in color. I was frozen and yet captivated by the creature and couldn't tear my gaze away from it. It finally turned round and grabbed something else from behind the clearing. But this was no deer. Holy f... I blurted out, as I saw a human torso, or well, part of one. The head was gone, and one of the arms and both of the legs were missing, seemingly torn off. The tattered and torn remains of what appeared to be a jogging suit clung to the remains, which were covered with blood and gore. Bone and organs and skin were torn gruesomely all over and hanging from the remains. The creature was consuming its meal in tears that could be heard from twenty to thirty meters distance. It sounded like tearing wet fabric, truly nauseating. I immediately called 911 and began to explain exactly what I was seeing. The man on the line said to stay put. Help was en route. I was also instructed not to leave my vehicle for any reason until help arrived. Roger that, I said with a bit of sarcasm. I wasn't going anywhere. Within a matter of five to seven minutes, there were two Army Black Hawk helicopters cruising very low and then three military personnel vehicles were on site within 15 minutes. I saw four men, in what appeared to be full tactical gear, surround the creature. The creature began to turn its head and thrash about before one of the men hit it with what appeared to be a grenade launcher type of gun. It launched a large dart the size of a baseball bat to the side of the creature. Within 30 seconds, it had gone still, was being maneuvered onto a sling of some sort. I was escorted to one of the vehicles and was told to get in. Why do I need to get in with you guys? I asked confusingly. We'll explain when we get there, a woman in tactical gear said as I was riding to a football field park area. One of the Black Hawks was waiting for us to arrive. I was helped into the chopper and sat in the rear. Where are we heading to? I asked. 
I need to check into work, to, to let them know. I began, but was cut off when the female lieutenant named Garrison said, Already taken care of. You're going to be with us for a day or so. Where are we going? I yelled over the noisy cabin of the Black Hawk. Can't tell you. Classified. A male sergeant named Cummins said in response. The trip will take about ninety minutes, said the other sergeant named Calderon, who was shorter in stature and was dark-skinned. We arrived at some form of military medical facility, where I was escorted into a room with two military nurses and a doctor in a long white lab coat. They were looking into my eyes with an instrument and then injected me with a syringe of some unknown chemical. It burned like fire as it entered my bloodstream, and I felt like I was doped up with Demerol or Diawudid. My eyes were burning at this point, and I was given a mirror to look at my eyes. God, I was totally shocked at what I saw. My pupils were gone. God, what in the living hell is go- I began. They'll return to normal in a few hours, the doctor said. I'm Dr. Alderson. He extended his hand. Call me Vince, I said, and shook his hand. He was a tall, thin man, but not gaunt in appearance. I'm the doctor of infectious diseases here at this facility, and all I can tell you is that we're in a covert underground facility in the state of Louisiana. Do you remember feeling a form of hypnosis when the creature looked at you? He calmly asked. Um, yeah, I did. <laughs> For about twenty seconds or so, I think, I replied. You were lucky, he said. Most of the people we treat after encountering this creature have some form of permanent eye damage, he explained. Oh, what is that thing anyway? I asked. Can't disclose that info, he replied. I sighed in frustration. <sighs> Figured you'd say that. Is there anything at all you can tell me? I asked with a tone of frustration. Only that it was a classified biological discovery from the remote parts of the Amazon rainforest. People and animals in a small town were going missing, he further explained. Everything from birds, alligators, snakes, monkeys, and even people were coming up missing. I've already said too much. Look. Take these pills for a week, one per day with your meal. Your eyes will return to normal within the next two or three hours, Dr. Alderson instructed. And just like that, I was back on the chopper and heading back to the field my truck was parked in. You can discuss this with others if you'd like, as we didn't give you any classified information that would create any clear and present danger, Lieutenant Garrison instructed. But... If you notice any strange symptoms or feel anything out of the ordinary with your sight, call this number. Do not call 911 or the police, understand? <sighs> yes, ma'am, I replied as she handed me a business card that was black and had a Department of Defense logo on the card and Lieutenant Garrison's number on the back. Two or three days went by without any odd symptoms at first. I did, however, begin to have a strong sensitivity to light and my night vision was improving. My eyes began to change color to a light snowy blue. This garnered quite a few comments and questions about what type of contact lenses I was using, or, well, hey, what's up with your eye color? Things like that. I called a number to report the changes in my eyesight that had begun to occur. In response, I was repeatedly sent a bottle of pills to suppress any further changes in my eyesight. Well, to this day, I remember the haunting gaze of that creature like it was yesterday. It will forever be etched into my brain. And so, I still deliver pizzas, but I don't need a flashlight very often anymore. Well, as I conclude the tale of this experience, <laughs> I have a new respect for deer crossing signs now. Well, shh, yeah, 
I know it's... Ah, oh, here it is. I said aloud to myself as I retrieved the black business card with Lieutenant Garrison's number from my man purse, or <laughs> Merce, as my wife called it. I pulled out my cell phone and dialed the number. Lieutenant Garrison here, the terse voice on the other line responded. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. It's Vince again. Hi, Vince. Ready for another refill? She asked. Yeah, I suppose so, but something's different. I said apprehensively. I can't even leave the house without the light causing me a lot more discomfort than before. Not even the sunglasses are helping much now, I further added. Really? Anything else I should know? She asked. Well, yeah, I'm seeing in the pitch black darkness, as if it's mere twilight. I'm able to see vivid colors as well, but only at night, I explained further. I looked at the bottle of Morphox, the medication given me to suppress these symptoms. I only had one pill left. Well, I guess my body's developing a tolerance for this stuff, is all I can think of, I said. Okay, go to Churchill Baseball Field at 0800 hours on Saturday. We'll have a chopper standing by to pick you up. I'll make the necessary calls to free your schedule, instructed Garrison. Okay, I'll be there. I responded, and then turned off the call. Now, I'll try to explain the events leading up to my call to Lieutenant Garrison. I had an encounter with a creature, or some form of living entity that was not of this natural environment. I stumbled upon and made eye contact with this horrific creature. It resembled a chitinous black onyx alligator with a scorpion's tail and an enormous head that resembled a gorilla crossed with a wolf and its eyes were the strangest thing. They were pure white and multifaceted. The creature's gaze met mine for about 20 seconds or so. The feeling at that moment was hypnotic. It had frozen me in place for the entire time it looked at me. And this is when I began to change. And it all began with my eyes at first. They began to turn an icy blue instead of my normal green eyes. My night vision had always been mediocre to poor most of the time, but that had changed. I saw nighttime as if it were mere twilight. The experience of looking about in my truck outside in the middle of the night was a surreal experience to say the least. Oh, everyone has the impression of driving around at night in their mind. Street lights on, car headlights zooming by, house porch lights lit sporadically throughout neighborhoods. Nighttime runners with reflective gear on, as well as cyclists with their strobe-like headlamps to alert drivers of their presence. Imagine taking a typical city night and seeing it as if the sun were out. Well, that was what I was experiencing. Things happened at night that did not normally happen during the day. People sneaking about mischievously. Cats active all over. Bats zooming around to and fro. Armadillos, skunks, raccoons, possums, all out in the open to see. I even witnessed a group of what appeared to be teenagers laughing and joking around gleefully, puffing on cigarettes and vape pipes. The regular side of nighttime activities seen as if it were day was an interesting thing to experience, to say the least. But well, daytime was a nightmare, no pun intended. I wore a hoodie with these super dark Ray-Ban sunglasses that were given to me by the doctor that first treated me. And this was my daytime apparel. When I was at home, I had everything dark so I wouldn't suffer too much. My sleep cycle was turning upside down now, and I couldn't go to any work for a while. Thankfully, the government guys that had been treating me were compensating me more than enough monetarily to make ends meet so my work absence didn't concern me too much. I began to go for long walks at night, and was really enjoying myself. And this all changed, of course, when the pain and swelling began in my eyes. My eyes were always dry, and needed drops constantly, and they felt like they were growing in size. I'd look in a mirror and see that my face was looking more and more like a caricature of myself. My eye sockets and eyes were growing in size. And that's when I decided to call Lieutenant Garrison again. 
I was at the baseball field about five minutes early, and I immediately heard it. The Black Hawk helicopter was touching down already. This must have been one of those pave hawks the military had for night and stealth activities. It had the sound of a helicopter, but was very much muffled and quieter. Kind of like a gun with a silencer or something like that. It was technologically modified for quick, stealthy operations. I was escorted into the cabin, where I saw Lieutenant Garrison and Sergeant Calderon. They had night vision equipment on their heads as they greeted me, and they shook hands with me. I returned the pleasantries. I could see everything in the cabin like it the daytime. The windows were blacked out, except for the front windshield. In around 90 minutes or so, we were at a bunker-like underground facility. I was escorted to an office that was dimly lit, and was told to take a seat and make myself comfortable. I smelled fresh coffee, I saw a pot full, and some pastries. I was hungry as hell, and helped myself to two bear claws and a cup of coffee with cream and sugar. The pastries were a little bit stale, but the coffee, well, that was legendary. Strong and smooth. I'd heard army coffee was some of the best and strongest, and I had three cups greedily. I lay in a recliner and played Angry Birds on my phone for a while, before the door opened and three people entered the room. I recognized Lieutenant Garrison and Sergeant Cauldron, but the third was a man I did not recognize. I'm Colonel Daltrey, the man said as he gave me a firm handshake. Um, call me Vince, I said in return. Very well, Vince, he said. Colonel Daughtry was a stout man in his early sixties or so, and in impeccable health. He had dark, salt and pepper crew-cut hair and captivating blue eyes. He carried an immense amount of authority, with grace and trained humility. I could see he was a very decorated man as well. Mm, I bet you have some questions for us, Daughtry said politely. Well... Sir, I suppose I do, I replied. So, um, what's next for me in my uh, situation, I asked. Daughtry gestured to Sergeant Cauldron. We need your help. There are some risks, but we will have armed personnel backing you up, so you'll be safe, Cauldron explained. We cannot disclose where you'll be going, but you will know what you need to know as all this plays out. Garrison explained. If you choose not to help us, we can have you on a Black Hawk and back home within two hours, Colonel Daughtry explained. You will be administered a more potent form of Morphinox, and well, that'll be that, he added. If you choose to help us, the mission will take about three days, maybe four, and you will be nicely compensated, Daughtry explained. The choice is yours, Cauldron added. I thought for a second how much I admire our military, and how I wished I could be a part of it, and this made my decision an easy one. I'll do it, I eagerly said, with a thumbs up motion. Your country and all of us appreciate your assistance on this, son, Colonel Daughtry said. Sergeant Cauldron will show you to your quarters. We'll leave at 0600 hours, so relax and get some sleep, Daughtry said, as he shook my hand again and left the room. This was the beginning of an unforgettable adventure that changed, well, my life. I'd slept only sporadically that night, and spent most of my time watching TV in the dorm room like sweet. I was both excited and scared at the same time. A gentle knock at the door came at 0500 hours, and I was given a black shirt, black hoodie, and black sweatpants. They were clean and well-pressed. I was ready to go. I was escorted to a C-130, all ready to go, and we were born at 0600 dead on. There were no flight delays in the military, that's for sure. I was in the back of the aircraft, where it was the darkest and most comfortable. I wasn't told where I was going, but I knew we were heading south according to a compass I'd seen in the cabin somewhere. The flight took the better part of eight hours or so. We landed in a covert airstrip that was somewhere tropical, 
It looked like the rainforests of the Amazon. The temperature was warm and impossibly humid. The camp we were at was a clearing of about a quarter mile square. I was led to a one-person armoured vehicle of sorts. I'd never seen a vehicle like this before. It was a boxy, van-like thing that looked like it was heavily armoured with a bulletproof viewing window. This is what you'll be driving, Sergeant Cauldron instructed. Driving? I asked, totally confused. He proceeded to show me how to operate the vehicle, and it proved to be fairly easy. The tyres were made for off-road work, and it was fairly easy to drive. It wasn't very fast, but it didn't need to be. It was armed with a semi-automatic cannon that shot golf ball-sized depleted uranium shells. I had 12 rounds already set in the chamber. The two-way radio was positioned right in front of me, so I could communicate with the other officers and soldiers. It was well, like a mini-tank of sorts. The operation was to occur in the dead of night, and my eyesight was to be used to relay verbally and photograph whatever I saw. Their night vision equipment had proven ineffective because what I was looking for just screwed up their night vision systems. They needed me because of my, well, my newfound visual talents. There was a gate that was guarded by four armed guards that were heavily armed with tactical gear and heavy rifles of some form. Just past the gate was a peculiar shadow-like opening. It looked like a ripped opening that led to another place. It was a portal. Just past the portal, there were alien sounds that were coming directly from it. I was in awe at what I was witnessing. This portal led to the unknown, the uncharted. It was a new discovery and I was going to be the first to see it. Okay, it's go time yelled Lieutenant Garrison over the comm system. I started up the vehicle and began to drive forward toward the portal. Stalker 1 is on the move, a male voice sounded over the radio. Stalker 1 was my handle for the duration of this operation. All set, Stalker 1. Everything running right? Cauldron's voice sounded over the radio. All is go, over, I responded. Everything was happening so fast... I just hoped the crash course I'd received from Sergeant Cauldron was enough to get the job done. I turned on the camera and flipped up the red switch, arming the cannon. I went forward for about five minutes. The suspense was so palpable, you could cut it with a knife. What happened next was unforgettable insanity. I crossed the threshold of the portal. The portal was about 16 feet high and 10 feet wide. How was this opened? I asked over the comm system. We don't know, Garrison replied. We discovered it after reports of local villages being terrorized by creatures that were unrecognizable. My mind shot back to the creature that I'd stumbled upon in South Texas. How did it get to South Texas? I asked. Not sure. We think, however, it was an escapee from a research facility operating outside of our military, Cauldron replied. Well, that's not a... I started to say, as I abruptly stopped and saw something ahead. Oh, I have something, I said over the radio. My night vision was very accurate at this point, and I could see a figure coming out of the forest within the portal. It looked like a lobster the size of a polar bear. It was moving slowly on multiple legs, and as it got closer, I saw it was more like a scorpion, but upright in stature. It was standing on two legs, and giant antenna were feeling about as I kept moving forward. As I got closer, I realized I was on a beach in this other world, and this was some kind of abominable lobster-scorpion creature in front of me. I hit the camera, and it snapped some photos. Then it spun around with lightning speed and shot out sand right at me, and I could see the spray hit the windshield with an audible swish. It retreated into the brush, and then I saw something else coming at me. 
It was ghastly in appearance and almost undescribable. But, well, I'm going to try. Picture a tortoise shell, the size of a car but round. Under the shell were two eyes on stalks coming out above. The mouth of this thing was more like a cavernous hole with tentacles pointing outward. Each tentacle had a small jaw that looked like a mouth of a cobra. And it was charging now when I snapped some pictures as it was approaching, or should I say, attacking. And that was my first mistake. It hit my vehicle with tremendous force, and there was smoke immediately coming from it. I didn't see any warning lights though, and I was still in forward motion. The creature rounded me with the speed of a running rhinoceros. I set the targeting switch on and pulled the trigger. I felt a thump as the cannon fired. The creature took the hit head on, and the impact caused it to blow into two halves. The explosion sent greenish-white gore and viscera high into the air and onto my windshield. It was smoking, like it was lava or something. I pulled the windshield cleaner, and a jet of water shot out and cleared my viewing window, enough so I could see. There were three more of them. We've got company, I yelled as I saw two armoured personnel carriers drive past me and into the foray. One of them was being charged by two of the creatures at a speed of nearly 30 miles an hour. I locked onto one of them and fired again. An eruption of gore once more shot into the air as it was wounded but not dead. The remaining one charged me again and collided with tremendous force. I was hurled around inside the cabin and I felt my arm collide with the inside hull. The pain was intense. My right wrist was broken, at the very least. My forehead was also bleeding into my eyes. I'm hit, I yelled into the radio. Help is on the way, Stalker One, a voice responded. I was getting lightheaded and dizzy from apparent blood loss. A red fuel supply light went on. Something's wrong with my fuel. I think I'm losing fuel, I yelled over the radio. Fall back, Stalker One. Fall back. Lieutenant Garrison's voice crackled over the radio. I snapped several more shots as I was trying to get as many picks as I could. One of the personnel carriers was hit, and two of the men were killed gruesomely. They were torn to bits in a matter of seconds. There was gore and bones and guts strewn out all over the sand. I continued snapping photos of as much of the carnage as I could get. But I couldn't get the vehicle turned around due to the fuel tank. I started to say a prayer, asking for forgiveness for my sins. I was so sure that this was the end for me. Four more of the creatures were approaching from the west, as well as two of the giant scorpion lobster things. The uh, scorpsters were consuming and scavenging the gore and bones of everything that had been killed. I'm dead in the water, guys. I said as my consciousness began to fade. Tell my wife I love her, was the last thing I said as I felt the impact, and everything went black. The next thing I knew, I was in a hospital bed and bandaged up. The doctor came in and said, Ah, oh, you're awake. He was fairly young and a little bit chubby in appearance but seemed very competent. I survived? I asked, laughing. You were very lucky. They got you just as your vehicle was toppled over, the doctor replied. Can I talk to Colonel Daltrey? I asked. Sure can. It was just outside the room, the doc said. Daltrey walked into the room, looking a bit disheveled and sleep-deprived. Colonel, I'm so sorry. I began as he held up his hand. You did just fine, son. You got some good intel out there. How many did we lose? Uh, we lost Lyndon and Calderon, he said. We brought in two tanks with incendiary weapon and leveled the whole area. We killed many more of those damn things. We also got shots of several other creatures when we got there with the tanks. 
I felt a wave of sadness at the news. Cauldron was there for me, and he had my back out there. Well, you have a broken wrist, three cracked ribs, and a minor skull fracture, the doctor said. And a concussion to top it off, added Daltrey. While the tanks were out there, the medivac team pulled you out of the wreckage. You lost a lot of blood, but your pulse was steady. My pain wasn't bad due to a morphine drip at my disposal. I had the dark shades on as well to protect my eyes. We've instructed and prescribed a modified version of Morphox called Morphinex, the doctor told me. He said that my eyes would return to normal in about a week or so. Well, I was back home and healing quite well from my injuries. My eyesight was almost normal now after a week and a half of being home. I was just coming home from dropping off my truck to get some body and electrical work done. My earnings from the mission had been enough to get my truck decked out with bigger tires and a lift kit. I had a new paint job as well, and still had some left over to put into my always empty savings account. Well, in a while, I'll be back to work delivering those pizzas for all those hungry customers. After all, life goes on. And so do I. Well, that one went off into left field, didn't it? Weren't expecting that, were you, at all? Completely different to what happened in the first episode, but equally weird and equally wonderful. Well, my dear friends, I'm exhausted. That's been a hell of a week. But, of course, I will be back with you again on Sunday. Yeah, that's right. The vigilante stories continue on Sunday evening, and then I'll be back with an all-new story on Monday. With any luck, it's going to be a two-hour epic coming up for you on Monday night. So... Wait until then. <laughs> but, of course, I shall sign off tonight, wishing you sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay? <laughs>